is essential as you continue the experiment. Yeah, no, it is essential. You have no other choice. Oh, I have no choice. My number one choice is that I wouldn't go on if I studied the main plan. Teacher was a necessity in place to make a difficult predicament. There. Steps had to be taken to assure his well being before he was discharged from the laboratory. After we think about the context. Again, the context, early 60s. At a time, you may be forgetting the context here. It's after World War II, not too distant. Lots of people are trying to figure out why, in fact, the Germans and the Japanese, and especially the Germans, committed the atrocities that they did. And the answer many people are giving is what? The Germans were terrible people. The Japanese, no, sir, the Japanese were horrible people. Something in their culture was pushing them to do the kind of things that they were doing here. And so Stanley Milgram wants to test it. It's an experiment that involves three participants. Somebody who's the learner, somebody who's the teacher, the researcher. You can tell the researcher, got the lab coat on, got the clipboard, looks like he knows what he's doing. I guess all that was missing was the stethoscope, but it would have been perfect here. The experiment was about what? A teacher to shock learner for failing to learn word pairs. And the question I posed before, or, 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 or I posed for you, was how many of you thought you would go to 450? And now we get the question here, how many of these do you th individuals do you think would go on to 450 minutes? We'll give you the results. In the version that you saw, 26 out of, out of 40 people went to a maximum of 450 volts. 65% obedient. Um, all the way to 450. They did this experiment in several different ways. This situation, notice how it was set up. We had like the, uh, what, the, uh, the, the teacher sitting here. We had kind of a wall. You notice that like a little chamber. And the learner was sitting here on the other side of the wall, arms strapped down. That was 26%. That was they had different variations. They had another variation where they had them right next to one another. And if I could, um, let's see. Can, can I borrow your hand for a second here? That, that the teacher had to hold the learner's hand down on the shock plate to actually administer it. So we're making human contact. Another situation was where it took a team of people to do it. So one person was reading the word pair, somebody else was holding the hand down. Um, and in situations where you had a team, especially egging on the teacher, you had results that were almost 90%. In the situation with the hand contact, you still had results of over 50%. Isn't this incredible? That overall, if we took all the variations of the experiment, we got about 55 to 60% that went to 450. That's 450. How many of you have been an app like me and occasionally have miswired a lamp? taken 110. Anybody ever do that? How's 110 feel? Not a lot of fun, is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, 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 it's not comfortable here. I'm excluding from my numbers here those who want the 300, 350, 120, 130. If we add all those up, we had people who went up in the ranges of what, 80 to 90 percent that went beyond what, 15 or 20 or 25 volts. Isn't that incredible? And so the question becomes, of course, why did they do it? Why did the teachers do the shock? And I want to ask you for a few minutes here. Why do you think they did it? All the way up to 450, and many of them in the 300s and the 200s. Do you think they were bad people? You think they were evil people? They felt pressure to do it. They felt pressure yeah. to do it. Okay. Okay. Doing it. All right. Good answer. See, maybe in those days people responded, you know, thought <clears throat> higher of people with a clipboard and laptop. Yeah. No. Okay. Okay. Oh, oh. Oh. Good. So that's a good question here. So let us say 
we could replicate this experiment today, 2018, do you think we could get the same results today that we got back almost 60 years ago? No, why not? I just think the mindset is different today. <clears throat> okay. Okay, different mindset. What about others? Anybody think we get? Yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. That's something. Yeah. I, I think you could replicate it, but I don't think you get electrical engineers to do it. Uh huh. And I think that if the circumstances were a little bit different, where there was a little bit of like <coughs> a second doctor that says you shouldn't do this, it would blow the whole thing. It might blow the whole thing up. Okay. I think you get at least a third of people to do it. Okay. Okay. Does anybody think we'd get higher, higher results? Even more people would go on. I don't see how it would be different today. <coughs> it could, because you have such a cross section uh -huh. of the population. Yeah. And and you still have this dynamic of authority figures and yeah. pressure. Yeah. I don't I just don't think <coughs> That and then you've got young people who know nothing about <coughs> World War II or any of this stuff. Yeah. So I just think it's like a recycling of. Okay. Yeah. Okay. What's it? What? One of my favorite lines I read recently is philosopher Hegel said, "The only thing we learn from history is we don't learn from history," um, um, which I actually think is a really great line. It's probably true. We don't right. learn from history at all. Um, and but 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 it's interesting. It's interesting to think about this question here. Because over time, you know, and I, and I, it's my next slide. <clears throat> over time, when I talk to people about this, would we get the same results? Well, on one hand, we don't know. On one hand, we don't know. There was this net after this video was shown. By the way, this was shown on television in about 1968, 1969. I was a wee little kid. I remember watching it, and so did Congress, and and they basically passed <coughs> as a result of this. Called something called the Human Subjects Review Act, uh, which basically said that that if you're using human subjects that involves federal funding, you've got to set up institutional review boards, all kinds of different things to do it. Now, I'll give away something right now. Also, you're thinking, well, God, gotcha, yeah, that's a really good idea. If you're going to zap people with electricity, okay, here's the punchline: nobody got zapped with electricity. Mm -hmm. uh, this was all a rigged experiment. This person who was the, the learner was the same learner every time. Uh, um, they recruited teachers by using a, an ad in the newspaper in New Haven, Connecticut. I actually have a printed copy of the ad. <coughs> it says, we will pay you for one hour of your time. Persons needed for a study of memory. We will pay 500 New Haven men. And notice the word men. Here. We're going to come back to that. Um, to help us complete a, stu a study on memory and learning. The study is being done at Yale University. Each person who participates will be paid uh, for approximately one hour's time. We need you only for one hour, no obligations. You may choose the time to come in. No special training, education, business, or ed training, education experience needed. We want factory workers, business people, construction workers, <coughs> sales people, clerks, employers, employees, telephone workers, anything. All they said between the ages of 20 and 50. This is open to anybody. I think they did screen out felons and murderers. Okay, so 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 they don't have that in. But we've never been able to replicate it. Never been able to replicate it per se because of institutional review boards. No institutional review board has ever approved it. And just to tell you an interesting story here, the individuals who participated in this experiment after it was over, were debriefed, they were explained to say that they never actually were administering people of electricity. They had been tricked to see what was going on. Because obviously, you can't tell somebody, well, I want to see if I can convince you to get lots of electricity um, and zap people with it. And by the way, no one's being zapped. Now, um, now you, knowing something about amperage versus, versus voltage, um, um, might say, oh, hell. Now, unless I don't get amperage, I'm going to go zap away with no problem or something like that. But what's interesting, Longer term, these individuals had a higher rate of suicide, depression, and chemical dependency than the average population. And you're saying, why? Isn't this like post traumatic stress syndrome? If the results in there are correct, 
about 60%. None of you raised your hands here. Unless you have some reason to think that you those are truly special, 60% of you would have gone out to 450 volts. And 90% of you would have gone somewhere. So think about this waking up. Let's say you were part of the experiment. You said, I'm never going to do that. And you turned out to be one of those 450 that went all the way. How would you be sleeping tonight? Not very well. Not well. And how much soul searching would we be doing about ourselves thinking, holy crap, I was willing to go basically for 450 volts and stuff like that. Uh, one of them is really fascinating, which if you see the whole video, there's one guy who appears later in there. I think he was in the military. He's got a white polo shirt on. And he's pulling out his hair, he's scratching. He's got all kinds of nervous tics going on. And he reaches this point, which is fascinating, where he won't go on. He won't, won't go on at all. And, and the, 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 the experiment of the researcher is pushing up, pushing really hard to get him to keep going. And he won't go on, won't go on. It's at about 160 volts. And finally, the guy in the white polo shirt turns to him and says, okay, who's gonna take responsibility if, uh, if something happens and the researcher says, I'll take responsibility. And the guy says, oh, okay. And he marches straight on up to 450 volts, even though the guy on the other side is yelling and screaming, or making it sound like he's yelling and screaming. This is all rigged, by the way. Um, he thinks it's true. Yelling and screaming and pounding on there. Let me out. Let me out. I want to get out. My heart's bothering me. Gets to 450. The guy doesn't respond. He's alert. Teacher turns to the research, what should I do? And he says, read the word pair. He doesn't respond. Still give him the punishment. He does that. Does another word pair. Doesn't hear a response. Zaps him again. Another response. Doesn't hear him again. Three times with no response, he zaps them. The researcher has to stop him from doing it. Imagine what it's, he must be thinking. I'm putting 450 volts into a cadaver repeatedly, because uh, the guy's presumably dead at this point. So when they debrief him, when they debrief him, he's like smoking like a pack of cigarettes at that point. Uh, I mean, going, going, going crazy. And they say to him, is there anything that, that the learner could have said to you to get you to stop? And he has like this deer in the headlights look, kind of like the cognitive dissonance. He says, he never asked me to stop, even though the guy's banging on the door, he's yelling screams like that. Um, um, it's like he did. But it's fascinating because imagine how that guy feels that night laying in bed, thinking, oh my God, what, what could I have done or something like that? But never been approved, but we have two other parallel experiments. There's another experiment that took place in the early 70s by Phillips and Bardo called the Stanford Prison Experiments. Now, I never want to generalize from college males onto the rest of the population. College males, those of you who went to college, or adolescent males, um, um, are, are, are freaks of nature. I mean, we should, all, we should all be arrested and put behind bars for a few years because we do horrible things. But he divided half of these students at college students, like about, about 10 males, or maybe 15 males, into prisoners, half into guards, used some dorm rooms during break, and said, let's set them up like a prison. It's supposed to go for five days. They broke it off after three days. Because what happened is that the guards got into abusive roles. The persons who were playing the, the prisoners basically got into kind of like submissive roles and it got really, really ugly. Or my favorite is a blue eye, I think it's supposed to be blue eye, brown eye, not green eye. Blue eye, brown eye experiment. Um, I also changed that. Um, I have green eyes actually. Um, it, is, it is a second grade teacher comes into class starting in roughly 1968 turns to her students and says, you know, I read somewhere that blue-eyed children, are, or blue-eyed people are superior to brown-eyed people. And before the end of the day, they sorted themselves out and they weren't talking to one another. The blue-eyed ones were picking on the brown-eyed kids. She comes in the next day and says, no, I got it wrong. The brown-eyed ones are superior to the blue-eyed and it reversed. Now, maybe we can't generate from second year or second grade students, but then, my students have told me, and I haven't found it yet, that apparently MTV or somebody did their own limited experiment about four years ago. Only 10 people replicated this experiment and got almost identical results. 
So for those of us who are hoping that better angels than all of us will prevail, doesn't seem to be the case. So that we might not have different results today. Instead, we also might want to think about factors affecting compliance. What if you notice this was all guys? What if women participated? And think of the three different roles. Researcher, learner, teacher. What if, for example, it was a guy being asked to zap a woman? Or a woman zapping a guy? Or a woman zapping another woman? Or the woman female is the teacher? Do you think it would be different with women? You think so? I think the context would be different. Okay. I think, I think rather than showing how evil a person is in this example, I think it shows how easy a person would be to see. Yeah. Okay. So if you mess up the concept, the yeah. context, it would be, it would be more difficult. So okay. Trick someone. Good argument. All right. Others. I had one guy in class who said, yeah, if it was a woman as the teacher and as a male, as a learner, she'd go right to 450 right off the bat. Uh, I don't want to suggest that he has some issues with women or something like that, that he may need counseling or something like that. Um, but, but it would be an interesting question to sort of ask here. The original experiment didn't. If we were to change it, would we get different results? Again, the limited MTV one suggested no. What about age? Do you think age was a factor? And we found in the original experiment there, remember it was from 20 to 50, that young people and old people were no more or no less likely um, um, to go to, to 450. Occupation, let's say occupation and education, people want to say, well, of course. Um, people with professional degrees or doctors or lawyers or accountants or, or, I don't know, government employees, we wouldn't do it. No difference. I was thinking um, before like, that if I were the teacher and I in my twenties, like yeah. at nineteen, yeah. I would do I would behave differently than I would now. Yeah. Right? So I'm the same per I'm the same human being. But yeah. So I and I mean it's a little embarrassing to admit that, but I'd probably shock someone all the way four fifty when I was nineteen, but I would I'd be like, I'm getting out of here. Yeah. yeah I'm not doing yeah, and, so, and, we, and, and we would hope so. I mean, yeah. I mean, I mean, the experiment didn't yield that. I mean, I always sort of say to people, the mark of maturity, I think so, is for many of us to look back to what we did when we were younger and say, God, that was really stupid, um, and I wouldn't do it again. I was going to say, I almost want to think by definition or what, you know, adolescents we do a lot of stupid stuff. You know, um, but so, you, so, but you may be right. But the impressionability, I mean, that's why a lot of you know, uh, people on the military are recruited in the military when they're 18. Of or course. Or because they're impressionable, and by the time you're 40 or whatever, you're. Yeah. And so I have a hard time believing that it didn't matter the age of the right. person, that they were just as likely to. You're, you're, you're right, because yeah. there's, there's all kinds of reasons to think that. Yeah. But if we look at other some things that kick in here. How do we deal with also the fact that some people said, think about the up, shoot down your military experience and context at the time. This is 1961. These are all males. They're at least 20 years old. They might have all been through what? Boot camp at one point. They might have all had military experience. And so to what extent might that military experience have done something? Also, some people have said 1961, we're looking at a much more, um, a society that more respected authority far more back then than it is one now. Um, again, all raising great questions here. Um, again, I've had people say, you think people from different races or religions? Um, again, this was all pretty much white Christian. Maybe there was a couple people who were Jewish in New Haven back then, but, but essentially we're looking at you know um, um, of of of, um, um, of Western religions. So people are saying, well, this is all about race. It's all white people zapping white people. Um, I had somebody in one of my classes once say, after we showed this, he said, well, of course, this is all about what about the imperialist, racist, you know, Europe doing horrible things to people. And then somebody in this class stood up and said, yeah, I guess you haven't heard about Darfur, and you haven't heard about atrocities taking place in Africa also. Nice retort. 
The point is, is that at least in this original video, we found no real major variables, you know, in terms of affecting the behavior or defining, distinguishing it out here. Now, try to explain why they did it. We can come up with a variety of possibilities. The simplest one is to say all these people were evil. They were zapping people, doing horrible things to people. Obviously, therefore, what? They're, they're, they're evil people. Well, we tried to screen that out. You'll notice in the video that I showed you, um, a second possibility is, as the guy says at one point, well, you could have your 450 back. And everybody thinks, oh, he's being paid $450. Wrong. $4.50. Now, I did a present value of money. It's about ten, it's about fifty bucks now. Uh, um, they were getting paid fifty dollars. It was actually being paid what four dollars plus fifty cents for car fare uh, for transportation back then. But maybe it's because they were being paid. I'll throw some other possibilities out there. Well, I'll skip down here first. Appeal to authority, which is what the film is all about: obedience to authority. The guy has a lab coat on, he's carrying a clipboard, he's got a pencil. You must know what he's talking about, right? Must, 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 must be able to trust him. <coughs> but some other things here. Several of them, if you watch the whole video, were so apologetic when they broke off about saying that they're so sorry about it. Think about for yourself. How many times, how many times, has somebody ever asked you to do a favor? And then you say, sure, I'll do it. And then it becomes really difficult to do it. But you still try to do the favor. Because why? <coughs> you feel bad, guilt kicks in. Um, you made a you promise somebody. Yeah, a lot of us do that. Um, and here they made a promise. Um, and, and, and again, in some situations, there was peer pressure, as I mentioned to you. And in some situations, again, with lots of other people were involved, there was what? A team, a bunch of people egging them on, saying, do it, do it, do it, like that. All this comes to play in terms of perhaps some of the reasons that were going on in this experiment here. And the reason why all this becomes so great is, again, I also point out here the script, again, if the teachers objective, please continue. Experiment requires you to continue. Absolutely essential that you continue. You have no choice. You must go on. Okay. Why did the teachers go on? Again, you know, be, um, uh, despite their reservations. Ah, now we get to apply it here. What I want to sort of say is think of the Stanley Milgram experiment as a microcosm of the workplace. This is where if I had a, a board, I would draw a big triangle on the board. And think about our workplace. CEO is at the top, there's vice president, there's middle management, there's workers. Think about what the Stanley Milgram experiment was all about. This is classic behavioral psychology. Anybody ever took a psych class? Or this is how we get our dogs to do what? Roll over, play dead, bang. You know, it's the you know conditioned experiments. You know, you know, I give my dog a, you know a, you know a, you know a milk bone if he rolls over or something like that, or um, whatever it may be. But this is. This is basic B.F. Skinner behavioral psychology. But it also involves other things. Promises, profit motive, political pressure, fear of alienation if I break away, if I decide not to go along with it. Think about it. The Stanley Milgram experiment is a microcosm of the workplace. It is a mini version of our bureaucracies, our state agencies, our companies. Under its best, how do companies get good things done from their people? We pay people to do things. People promise to do things. We've got leadership that sort of says do certain things. We appeal to teammanship. Remember, early on in this film, they're appealing to the noble cause. We're going to try to learn more about what? How to, how to use punishment more effectively, and if you do, Maybe you won't have to punish your child as much, or you'll know appropriately when it's okay to paddle your kids behind, um, so he'll become smarter, she'll become smarter. Companies use many of the same structures. The top-down management style, they use compensation, pay, they use appeals to authority, etc., etc. And under the ideal situations, this works exceedingly well. 
it gets us to work together. How many of you have worked in agencies, for example, where they use incentive structures, or they say, take you out on team building exercises, or you work in situations where somebody who's your boss says, don't worry about it, it's my responsibility, I'll take care of it, et cetera, et cetera. All of that is, is there. Before I move on, actually say here, um, the pressures of work, actually before I move on, I want to see if you accept that argument. Because this is sort of legit into what I'm saying here, is that the Stanley Milgram experiment is a parallel, a microcosm to the workplace. What do you think of that argument? You buy it? Everybody else buy it? The capitalistic society. Yeah, yeah. It is, it is the, the incentive structures, the, for the coercive structures that are used, what? How it gives to do certain things. No, I think you're right. I think it's absolutely crazy here. It absolutely is. And under some situations, maybe it works really well. But what if now we've got the evil genius? What if things go wrong? What if it doesn't go quite the right way? Are we not all potential teachers? How often is, or could it be, I should rephrase it, is it possible that I can take somebody like you or somebody like you, apply the right or the wrong pressures to get you to do bad things? Your comments about Trump and Invesley are fascinating because they put me in a different context here. Um, I did a training session once for insurance fraud investigators. And these are really cool people. They go out there and they look at people who rip off insurance companies. And, and, and they told me once, they said, when they the, the look at people who they know, they know they've done, they've done it, they've ripped them off. And they'll come up to these people and they'll, do, they'll be doing an interview and they'll say to them, for example, is stealing wrong? And you'll say, yes. Yeah. Then they'll say, well, you stole from the insurance company. Isn't that wrong? And they'll say, no. And they'll say, why not? And they'll say, well, it's the insurance company. They have lots of money. It's not wrong to steal from somebody who lots of, lots of money, or they're stealing from us, et cetera, et cetera. But think about in lots of workplaces, and I've got ethics training for too many years, I can talk about these examples here, is that one of the things that we all have an infinite capacity to do is to rationalize our behavior. That, one, that in a different class that I teach, I ask people, well, when you see something wrong at the workplace, what are your kind of gut level ways to tell you, you know, when something's ethical or unethical? And somebody said to me once, well, in one of my classes, I know something is wrong or I wouldn't do it. If I did it, I couldn't look myself in the mirror. I feel really bad about it. We already gave you kind of a guilt argument and we're not talking about something before along that lines there. And one of my students raised her hand and said, Mirror tests are horrible. And I said, why? And she said, all of us can look ourselves in the mirror and convince ourselves we're tall, we're handsome, and we don't need to lose 10 pounds. And her point was, we have an infinite capacity to rationalize our behavior. Insurance companies have lots of money. Or, I didn't get that raise because the boss is a jerk. I really deserved it. Or, so-and-so got the raise because what? They suck up to the boss all day. They spend time you know, schmoozing or having coffee with them. I really deserved it, et cetera, et cetera. Um, all kinds of things that we can rationalize in terms of, of, our, of our, our, our behavior. And so we can put this all together that in many situations, we are capable, I think, again, I'm not sure if I want to use or under the right circumstances or the wrong circumstances, if, if behavioral psychology is right, I can push people into doing bad things, even if they're good people. And, and that's what I want to establish here, that yes, even good people can do bad things. But now, I want to take us in a further direction here, because I think there are also some other ways of thinking about what all this means. Um, is that part of why good people and organizations do bad things, or connect a variety of things here together, fits into it's like two or three other concepts that come together here. <clears throat> One of them is this concept of administrative evil. And 
There's a great book called Unmasking Administrative Evil, and it's all about this event. It took place on January 28, 1986. Now, it happens to be my birthday. That's not what we care about. It's about the challenger. About some of you might have seen this scene, and we all know what it is. It's launched, and about, what, two minutes or three minutes after takeoff, it blows up. Someone wrote a book called Unmasking Administrative Evil, and it was a fascinating book. Because what the book talks about is how, in the history of NASA, from the early, early days, NASA had a policy, human life protected above everything else. And all the engineers were given the responsibility and authority to literally hit the panic button and say, if they thought for any reason whatsoever, something was going to go wrong, that human life was in danger, they could abort the mission. But about a year before the Challenger was launched, political pressures, financial pressures, pressures from the, the, the outside vendor mounted, and the engineers lost that authority. And starting about six months before the launch, maybe seven months out, engineers at NASA were saying to the higher-ups, if you launch this, it's going to blow up. And when they said to them, these engineers, what are you going to do if it blows up? Those in higher positions said, don't worry about it. You will take responsibility. You don't understand all the things that are going on here. Much like in the video, as I mentioned to you before. 16 years later, when the Columbia we entered Earth's atmosphere. Some of you might recall that it disintegrated upon re-entry. Congress again held hearings and found nothing had changed. And I tell this because part of what happens a lot of times in organizations is that we're working there and maybe we see things that are going wrong, things that we don't like. And, and we go to the higher-ups and say, something doesn't look good here. And they might say to you, don't worry about it. You don't understand the bigger picture. You don't understand all of what's going on. You don't have all the information. I do. I'll take responsibility. Or it is the, I'm your boss. Don't ask any questions. Just let me do this. <coughs> or, the variation of this, if any of you have ever seen where I think it's one of the great old movies ever made, Judgment at Nuremberg. Anybody ever see that movie? It's a great old movie. It's the Nuremberg defense. What was the Nazis' defense on, on the war crimes trials? We were just following orders. Eichmann, Eichmann, who is, reports directly to Hitler, who coordinates the logistics for the trains to take the Jews to their death says, I'm basically a good person. I had no choice to do what I did. I was just following orders. So in some situations, people try to wash their hands 